Buddhism is one of the most ancient belief systems in the world. Buddhism is both a religion and a philosophy. Only your own understanding saves you from suffering. It is practiced by over 350 million people today. There are many people who feel attracted to a religion which empowers the human individual. I'm going to travel to seven wonders of the Buddhist world. Seven wonders that give an insight to the long and rich history of Buddhism. At each location, I'll meet Buddhists who will help me to understand a different concept that forms the core of Buddhist belief. I'm going to explore how it started, where it traveled, and some of the most spectacular monuments built by Buddhists right across the globe. And to try to get to the bottom of the attraction of this philosophy for mankind for close on 2,500 years. Buddhism's numbers grow year on year, and I'll be uncovering why, as I experience seven modern and ancient wonders of the Buddhist world. This is northeastern India, where Buddhism began around 500 years before Christ. Millions of pilgrims come to this country and to the sacred city of Bodhgaya to visit the place where a young Indian prince underwent a life-changing personal transformation and came to be known as the Buddha. I've studied the period in history when the Buddha lived for over 20 years, and I just love it because this was such a radical age. This was a time when men like the Buddha and Socrates in ancient Greece turned the world of belief upside down. Instead of focusing on tradition and convention and ritual, they dealt with ethics and the possibilities of the human mind. And I'm particularly fascinated to follow in the trail of Buddhism because as the philosophy has traveled through 25 centuries, it's marked out a path that leads directly from ancient society to the modern world. This is Mahabodhi, the great awakening temple in Bodh Gaya in northeastern India, our first wonder of the Buddhist world. The reason Bodhgaya is here at all is because two and a half millennia ago, one man had an internal, personal revelation while he sat underneath a people tree. It's a very quiet, simple beginning to end up with all of this. That man was called Siddhartha Gautama and we're told he renounced his privileges and family to embark on a rigorous quest. A journey to understand the inherent challenges of the human condition, sparked by the suffering, sorrow and deprivation that he saw all around him. It was a long and difficult journey. Siddhartha renounced the comforts of the material world. He meditated for weeks on end. He broke with the status quo, in a region that had been dominated by the old gods for the previous thousand years. Finally, he achieved Nirvana, what we loosely translate as enlightenment, and became known as the Buddha, or the Enlightened One. The Buddha, according to Buddhist scriptures, made his way to this spot and determined not to move until he found an answer to the world's suffering. So it was here, on one warm spring evening, 2,500 years ago, that the Buddha came to sit. We're told that all night he was tormented by demons. But then, as the sun began to rise in the east, he found enlightenment.
The Bodh Gaya Temple is the Mecca of Buddhism. It is where the Buddha attained enlightenment, according to their belief. And the Bodhi tree, or a great grandson of the Bodhi tree, still grows there. And so Buddhists go there to remember the great breakthrough that was the Buddha's discovery of the true nature of the universe. And inspired by the Buddha's example, you'll find visitors here from every corner of the globe, from the 90 or so countries where Buddhism still flourishes today. Bodh Gaya is one of the key sites for um, all Buddhists worldwide. It serves as a magnet, as a center point for Buddhists from around the world. You could say it's the place exactly where Buddhism started. I'm not a Buddhist, but if you ask anyone who's involved in Buddhism, they'll tell you that it's a very difficult philosophy to teach or to explain, and that the very best way to understand it is to experience it. And so, by experiencing Buddhism, I'm going to try to get to the heart of a philosophy that can sometimes seem complicated, out of reach. And I'll start with the three key principles of Buddhism, what are known as its three jewels. The first is the life and example of Buddha himself. All Buddhists are encouraged to model their approach to life on his. The most important single point in the Buddha's teaching, and one which distinguishes it very sharply from other religions, is that the Buddha taught that each of us is entirely and solely responsible for our own lives and our own salvation. No one else can be responsible. The Buddha didn't claim any divine status, nor did he profess to be a personal savior. He called himself a guide and a teacher. His message appealed to people of all social classes in ancient India, to merchants, to farmers, and to the untouchable caste. The Buddha, in the course of his spiritual awakening, rejected a good number of aspects of Hinduism. He rejected some philosophical components of Hindu beliefs. Um, he was very critical of the position of the Brahmins or priests in society at that time, which was a very elitist position. He was similarly critical of the caste system. He positioned himself as a result outside the caste system. The Buddha spent his remaining years traveling through deep forests, across mango groves, from village to village. The curious would bring food and clothing for the philosopher and his band of followers. And in turn, he encouraged them to reconsider the purpose and point of life, to recalibrate their moral compass. Although the Buddha didn't establish a church or temple system as such, over time, the significant locations in his life were gradually turned into shrines. Originally, Bodh Gaya was just a pastoral sanctuary, marked out with a stone balustrade 200 years or so after his death. But by the 6th century AD, a full-blown temple, the Mahabodhi Temple, marked the spot. About 400 years after the first temple that was built here for the worshipping of the Bodhi tree, was replaced by this kind of a temple built to enshrine the iconic image of Buddha, which had gained currency by that time. The temple, particularly the Mahabodhi temple, is representative of how important Buddhist temples were and how, you know, this idea of building a temple to enshrine statues started from here. As Buddhism's traveled through the centuries, perhaps inevitably, it's taken on more the aspect of a religion with temples and pilgrims and a religious hierarchy. You could be forgiven for mistaking Buddhism as one of the great God-driven faiths of the world, but there is a key difference. By putting such an emphasis on a system of personal morality and breaking with the conventions and traditions and rituals of the past, in many ways, the Buddha was one of those men who gave us the modern world. And although he never denied that there were gods, he simply said, 
you don't have to rely on the gods to make everything okay. According to Buddhist sources, having seeded a radical new world view, the Buddha died at the age of 84. His body was cremated, but his bones remained unburned. They were distributed amongst the various tribes, rulers and kingdoms who are now starting to follow the Buddhist way and who honoured its founder by building monuments or stupas over his remains. In Kathmandu, the capital city of Nepal, stands the Bodhanath Stupa, our second wonder of the Buddhist world. It was first built in the 5th or early 6th centuries AD, then rebuilt and restored a number of times, finally as this giant enclosed tomb in the 14th century. It is the largest in the Indian subcontinent, a sacred place for thousands of Buddhists throughout the world. Here at Bodhanath, I'm going to find out more about the three jewels of Buddhism. Buddhism consists, as far as Buddhists are concerned, in three things which they call the three jewels, and those three things are closely connected. The first is the Buddha, the founder of their religion. The second is called the Sangha, and that is the community of monks and nuns. The third is called the Dharma. The Dharma refers to the preaching, the teaching of the Buddha. In other words, it's what the Buddha discovered, and it's also the truth. As you walk around the Buddha out here, uh, you always have this sense that you're being watched. And that's because the Buddha's all-seeing eyes are always staring down at you. That squiggle in the middle of his face, incidentally, is not his nose. It's actually the Sanskrit character for the number one to represent a kind of unity in the Buddhist faith. But something you won't find represented up there are the Buddha's ears. And there is a particular reason for that. We're told that the Buddha said he never wanted to hear that he was being worshipped. And of course, that is what is so unique about Buddhism. This is a religion without a central authority figure. Instead, there's just this credo that man is his own lord and master, that mankind itself can control humanity's destiny. It's not atheistic because they do believe in the existence of sort of gods and angels and so on, but they simply don't believe that those beings have the universe under control and therefore they cannot save us from suffering. They themselves need saving from suffering from a future time when they cease being gods and they become uh, beings vulnerable to pain and suffering. At the Bodhanath Stupa, one of the many people who come to circumambulate and to pay their respects to the Buddha is Annie Choying, a Buddhist nun famous throughout Nepal for her sweet singing voice. She is in fact known as the Singing Nun. This is a very highly spiritual place we consider. It's a holy place. And we believe that all the great relics of the Buddhas are in the stupa and then it holds a very special religious spot. And every, peop every people who comes around here are always reciting mantras and really focusing on meditation. They do the circumambulation, prostration to keep the physical health healthy and the mind to be energy clean, chanting mantras as well as doing prayers. So trying to put yourself in a very good positive discipline. This is a very, very highly blessed place. Annie is originally from Tibet. Thousands of Tibetan Buddhists now live in Nepal as refugees. The brand of Buddhism here is as much Tibetan as it is Nepalese. Flexibility and diversity has always been one of Buddhism's strengths. The Buddha himself said there should be no one official Buddhist language. Instead, Buddhists are encouraged to focus on the universal relevance of the Buddha's wisdom. There are some people here who will tell you that buried deep in that stupa is a fragment of the Buddha's bone. Now, I'm not certain we're ever actually going to be able to prove that. Um, but what is sure is that this is the biggest stupa in the whole of the Nepal and one of the largest in the world. And 
it is immensely impressive. But do you know what's significant about it? Actually, it's not how it looks, but what it means. Because this was built to represent something very special. For the men who created this, this was nothing less than an incarnation of the Buddha's mind. The symbolism of stupa is very interesting because it takes the elements of earth, water, fire, wind, and space, you know, different shapes that represent those, and they put them in a kind of ideal aesthetic form. And so the idea is that the Buddha's mind is the awareness that the universe is the ideal environment for a human being to achieve freedom from suffering. Around the Buddha gathered men who shared with him a common vision and goal. Gradually, this group came to be a formalized community, a body that took its name from the old aristocratic councils of the day, the Sangha. The Buddhist Sangha became a monastic tradition, comprising ordained monks and nuns, and it's one of the three jewels of Buddhism. My first experience of the Sangha came at what felt like an ungodly hour. At Bodhanath every morning, just after dawn, monks of all ages gathered to perform the first of many rituals of the day. The Sangha is one of the oldest, continuously active spiritual organizations in the world. What's being recited here is a Tara Puja. Um, it's a chant that aims to ensure a kind of liberation from suffering. Um, and it's really interesting because Tara is thought to be a female manifestation of Buddha's wisdom, um, something which is incredibly potent. I mean, this isn't just an abstract idea of wisdom. This is thought to be able to be healing, to actually be stronger than medicine itself. The Sangha includes women and was set up to allow those who wish to practice Buddha's teachings a disciplined environment and maximum time to focus on the philosopher's ideas, free from the responsibilities and distractions of a domestic or conventional lifestyle. A few miles outside Kathmandu, Annie, the singing nun, runs her own nunnery. It's a refuge for girls many as young as 10, the age both sexes can embark on the life of a Buddhist novice. I have here mostly girls from families who are facing some difficulties, obviously poverty, and then other thing is the fathers are a little bit very ignorantly carried away with the alcoholic behavior as well as very abusive behaviors and who doesn't think that it's good to send their girls to school. So I try to collect them here and give them as much as I can give them. Controversial for its time was the inclusion of women among the ranks of the Sangha. The Buddha allowed women to become nuns, to lead a life devoted to spiritual development. Like Buddhist monks, nuns are expected to remain celibate, pure, since they are one of the three jewels of Buddhism. Not just Buddha's foot soldiers, but an incarnation of the belief system itself. So, I've learnt about two of the three jewels of Buddhism, the Sangha and the life of the Buddha. But what about the third jewel, the Dharma, or teachings? You can perhaps help me out a bit. How do you describe Dharma? What, what does dharma mean to you? According to my understanding, what dharma is, to do whatever you do, very practically, skillfully, for benefit of the all beings, without causing any harm, and for their well-being, including oneself and all, is dharma. Mm -hmm. Dharmana Hindu Bodho Sikh Islam Najay Dharma Chitta Koshudhata 
धर्म शांति सुख चाहे धर्म मीन्स द प्योरिटी ऑफ हार्ट धर्म मीन्स पीस एंड धर्म मीन्स वेल बींग ऑफ ऑल ह्यूमन सोसाइटी आर वे special ways that you can achieve dharma are there rules and regulations that show you what to do we are taught what causes suffering and what can cause suffering and how to avoid causing suffering in life one's own life and when you implement those teachings i think that is what really contributes towards one's own well-being and others well-being and i think that is In a Buddhist context, the word dharma refers above all to the teachings of the Buddha as he rediscovered them uh, in the process of his progress towards enlightenment. The reality of the dharma, uh, which holds you free from suffering, is what uh, they take the root of the word dharma, which means to hold. And the Buddha said, dharma holds a being free from suffering. Coming here to Nepal, it has been relatively straightforward to identify two of the jewels of the triple jewels of Buddhism. The Buddha himself, both ideas about him and his image are absolutely everywhere, as is the Sangha. Um, here in Kathmandu, there are monks and nuns at every street corner. What has been harder to pin down is the Dharma itself, um, the belief system, the philosophy, the religion, whatever you want to call it, of Buddhism. Maybe it's unrealistic of me to expect there to be one single definition for such a broad concept. Um, the Buddha himself said that the Dharma was like the salt of the oceans of the world, a universal taste. So the Buddha implied the Dharma could be tasted anywhere by anyone. The question for me as a historian is how that taste of the Buddhist Dharma could become universal. Practically, how Buddhism established itself as a global belief system. Buddha's teachings were charismatic and radical for their time, but as with all big new ideas, they needed a groundswell of popular support or a patron or both to gain a firm foothold and to really fly. While there was grassroots interest in what he had to say, it was about 200 years after the Buddha's death that Buddhism got a major boost. In 250 BC, the ruthless, all-powerful Emperor Ashoka, who controlled most of ancient India, proved Buddhism's greatest ally. Ashoka was haunted by the memory of the blood that he'd acquired on his hands as a result of the cut and thrust of his rise to power, and he decided to turn to the good. And in order to realize that ambition, he vigorously promoted Buddhist ideals right across the Indian subcontinent. According to Buddhist tradition, in the centuries following Ashoka's sponsorship of Buddha's ideas, the philosophy evolved into at least 18 different schools. One of these, the Theravada, still survives today and is mainly associated with South and Southeast Asia. Another came to be called the Mahayana, the Great Vehicle or Way, now most often found in North and East Asia. Ashoka, by embracing Buddhism, put a particular emphasis on the consequences of his actions, on what he thought and how he lived in the world, on his karma. Karma is a word well known in the West today. It has its roots in early Indian belief systems, but the value of karma became a fundamentally important Buddhist concept, and one that I'm going to explore at the Temple of the Tooth in Kandy, Sri Lanka our next wonder of the Buddhist world. Sri Lankan Buddhists believe that the tooth relic was brought to their country around 300 BC. Safeguarding the relic became the responsibility of kings, and over the years, the custodianship of the relic came to symbolise the right to rule. 
The Buddha is said to have given two legacies to future generations. The body of his teachings, the Dharma, and also relics of his physical body itself, which are now scattered in shrines right across the globe. And one of the most precious is kept in here, in the Temple of the Tooth. That relic makes the presence of the Buddha more graphic to people. So it gives them a power. Actually, many Buddhist temples around the Buddhist world have little relics, a piece of bone or something. Just like in Europe, you have relics of the saints. So it's a way of making the person's presence feel more immediate. That gives the temple more power as a magnet to draw the worshiper. The shrine stands right at the center of a paved courtyard. The ceiling is decorated with moonstones and floral designs. There are ivory reliefs on the doorways. The inner chamber contains the tooth relic and other sacred objects. And all around, there is a brightly painted corridor. conduct daily worship in the inner chamber of the temple. Rituals are performed at dawn, at noon and in the evening. The tooth is in this upper chamber in a casket of gold and is only revealed to a chosen few. The sacred relic is symbolically bathed with a herbal preparation made from scented water and fragrant flowers. This holy water is believed to contain healing properties and is distributed among those present. Once a week, mothers gather at the temple with their babies. All these little babies are waiting to be taken in to be blessed by the priest so that they have Buddha's power with them for the rest of their lives. They're given a little white piece of string to wrap around their wrist which shows that the Buddha is with them from now until they die. And it's thought incredibly important that they get the Buddha's blessing right at this early stage because everything that they do from now on, all their intentional actions, what they think, what they say and what they do, their karma will affect how they are then reborn in the next life. Karma is one of the main concepts of Buddhism. It's a belief that any of our intentional actions, both thought and deed, will be mirrored by something similar happening to us in the future. So if you harm someone, someone will harm you. This principle of cause and effect can bring consequences that are either good or bad, depending on what it is that you've done. Because Buddhists believe we have many lives, this good and bad karma can generate consequences both throughout this life and long into the next. Karma is what you do. The word literally means deed or action. But the Buddha said that all karma that matters is what is morally good or morally bad. And you decide what to do. Now, we must remember that for Buddhists, your life goes on beyond what we normally think of as this life. In fact, you are reborn an infinite number of times until you manage to bring that to an end. Buddhists use a metaphor to help explain what karma is. They say that if you sow thistle seed, then you can't expect apple trees to grow. And that is very clear. It's the basic principle of cause and effect. And as a historian, I know that that principle has real validity. That we are all affected by our past, and our past and our present together informs our future. So when the Buddha said that we should be mindful of our intentional actions, of our karma, and that our highest authority is our conscience, then he was making real sense. And he was also clarifying something about what it is to be human. Of 
course, the issue is that karma can be both good and bad. And in Sri Lanka, the fallout of action and reaction, of cause and effect, has been brutally tested in recent years. For nearly three decades, the country has been locked in a violent civil war in which close on 100,000 people have been killed. Sri Lanka is only now emerging from this debilitating conflict between the Hindu Tamil minority and a Buddhist Sinhalese majority. The Temple of the Tooth was badly hit and partially destroyed during the war. It's now been fully restored. Buddhists believe this cycle of death and destruction can be broken. They assert that by following a certain path, it's possible to break out of a continuous round of life and death and rebirth, which in Buddhism has a name, samsara. And samsara is the concept I'm going to investigate now as I move to the next wonder of the Buddhist world. Once Buddhist ideas had flourished in Sri Lanka, Sri Lankan monarchs sent emissaries to adjoining kingdoms in Southeast Asia to carry the Buddhist message. By the 11th century, Theravadan Buddhism was well established in Thailand. And here in Bangkok, close on 90% of Thais are now Buddhist. The reason that Buddhism has thrived so vigorously and tenaciously here is because right from its very outset, it's had the support of Thai kings. Um, a king here can aspire to be a Buddha himself. And there was one king who was actually a monk for 25 years before he came to the throne. Every time the royal family builds a new palace for itself, it will also construct next door a monastery and a temple complex as a kind of outward sign of its righteousness and commitment to the Buddhist cause. And here in Bangkok, the temple complex is certainly fit for a king. This is Wat Po, our next wonder of the Buddhist world. It's the largest and oldest temple complex in Bangkok. It's home to more than 1,000 Buddha images. The complex includes a temple, a working monastery and a large courtyard with a forest of stupas thick with exquisite handmade lotus motifs. And hidden within its own palatial hall, the golden reclining Buddha. The gold Buddha is 141 feet long and 49 feet high. Started in 1788, it took over five years to build. This is one of the most stunning, gobsmacking works of monumental art I've ever seen. I have to say, I love its audacity. I love the fact that it says, look at me, look at what mankind can do when he manipulates raw materials to create a thing of beauty. Uh, because here there are thousands of fragments of mother of pearl used and 153 plates of gold. But what it doesn't seem to me to say is that this is an incarnation of the middle path. Um, that essential Buddhist notion that extremes and excesses should be avoided at all costs. Because there's no doubt that this is a thing of opulence. It's enormous, it's gorgeous, and it's very sensuous. In history of Thailand, there are a lot of large-scale uh, reclining Buddhas built uh, all over the uh, central part of Thailand. Uh, because to build a uh, reclining Buddha, it's not a very easy process. Because most of the reclining Buddha is not made from casting. It's made from bricks, plaster, uh, or cement. It's considered a very uh, respectful uh, image. So it must be decorated with uh, a very valuable materials. And of course, the most valuable materials for decorating the image of Lord Buddha uh, should be gold. 
Gold in Buddhism symbolizes the sun or fire. The most valuable of metals, it's accorded a sacred status through its association with Surya, the sun god of the Hindu pantheon. For Buddhists in Thailand and other South Asian countries, gold is an element that signifies homage. A gift of gold is the ultimate demonstration of one's piety. The meritorious act of putting gold leaf on the surface of the Buddha's skin is to commemorate the living Buddha who had a kind of golden-like aura and or radiance, they believe. But gold and its association with wealth and might is also the way the Thai monarchs have used a showy form of piety to forge a strong relationship between Buddha's ideas and the power of the state. It was King Rama III who had the statue of the reclining Buddha opulently restored at the height of his reign in the mid-19th century. It's called the lion pose. It says he lay there in the lion pose as he was preparing to die. It's described that he lay down on his right side and he rested his head on his right hand. There's a reason that this Buddha has got such a serene smile. It's because he's achieved enlightenment, nirvana. It means that he's escaped what Buddhists call samsara, an endless cycle of life, of birth and death, of passion and desire and delusion that can only lead to pain and suffering. Samsara effectively constitutes a cycle of birth and rebirth. And uh, as long as we are in samsara, we are reborn innumerable times, uh, moving from one existence to the next. We can be reborn as a human being, as a divinity, or you can be reborn as an animal, etc. Tell me what you think samsara is. For me, uh, it's not just the physical picture of you know, the circle of being born and aging and dying. For me, it's, it has something to do with the state of mind as well, that you have to deal with your bad emotions, you feel you have problems, you feel suffering, you have, feel frustrated, you don't know how to deal with it. But this is just a small sample of so bad things that happen to you. You just keep go on and on and on, you, know, you, you can find a real peace or happiness. The wheel of life is a common visual depiction in Buddhism. At the time Buddha started to teach, many understood life as a relentless cycle where all were born, grew old, died and were reborn in another life. It was an eternal morass from which there was no release. But Buddha felt that an escape was possible. He taught that through one's actions, karma, and through a way of life that was characterized by wisdom, morality and compassion, via meditation and the triumph of the mind over craving, desire and excess, it was possible to achieve enlightenment, nirvana. He believed that this enlightenment would empower ordinary people to break free from samsara. This idea gives Buddhist funerals a distinctive character. Those present mourn their loss, but also hope that, thanks to their beloved's good karma, the dead are at least one step closer to enlightenment, that they have the chance of a rebirth as a better being, who one day can escape samsara. What goes round comes round, that's what I believe. This body is just like a house that we rent for a while. After we die, we have to find a new place to live. It's impermanent, it's just temporary. So good Buddhists believe that we should do our best in this life to guarantee the better place after we die. Buddhists say that there is only one certain way to break free from samsara, to eliminate the desires and the passions and the distractions of everyday life. 
Now, of course, that is very easy to say, and it's very hard to do. So over the centuries, Buddhists have employed specific, rigorous methods to break free from all of this, from the troubles and the temptations of the real world, and to set themselves on the path to enlightenment, to nirvana. And that is the truly radical thing about the Buddha's example. His belief that each and every one of us has the capacity to achieve liberation, to achieve our own enlightenment. It took the Buddha years to arrive at this radical belief. Ideas he developed through his own personal experience, in particular, an intense form of meditation. And it is Buddhist meditation that I'm now going to experience in our next wonder of the Buddhist world. Buddhism continued to spread throughout the medieval period. Come the 13th century, and Buddhism was flourishing in the Khmer Kingdom, modern-day Cambodia. The temple complexes here at Angkor are our fifth wonder. Angkor Wat began life as the sacred palace complex of a Khmer emperor who, in fact, favoured Hinduism over Buddhist ideas. These aren't just buildings, but have a grand ambition. The whole complex is said to be a symbolic representation of Hindu cosmology. The original temple honoured the Hindu god Vishnu, and incarnates the center of the physical and spiritual universe, a mythical mountain. A series of five rectangular walls represent other mountains, and the moats here evoke the cosmic ocean. This place reeks of a combination of earthly and divine power and of the close-knit relationship between gods and kings. And of course it was a belief in that relationship that inspired the creation of this complex in the first place. But for some people it was just too exclusive, too strictly hierarchical. And Buddhism offered a solution. It was the Khmer Emperor Jayavarman VII who converted to Buddhism, and his regime marked a clear dividing line with the old Hindu past. Before 1200, art in the temples mostly portrayed scenes from the Hindu pantheon. After his conversion, Buddhist scenes begin to appear as standard motifs. During his reign, there was a focus on building libraries, monastic dwellings, public works and more earthly projects accessible to the common people. So history in Cambodia takes a humanist turn. And as Buddhism rises in popularity, you find images of the Buddha and his followers emerging everywhere in the architecture, in gates, in walls and in temples. So now Angkor is showing the world a more human face. The Angkor complex is a prime example of the classical style of Khmer architecture. By the 12th century, Khmer architects had become skilled and confident in masonry, facing the monuments with intricate sandstone blocks. Angkor Wat is famous for the harmony of its world-class design. Architecturally, towers shaped like lotus buds are characteristic. Half galleries broaden the passageways, other galleries connect enclosures, and terraces appear along the main pathways of the temple. The walls are decorated with bas-reliefs, showing Hindu mythological figures and detailed narrative scenes. This one depicts the churning of the oceans. Other elements of the design have been destroyed by looting and the passage of time. They included gilded stucco, gold on some figures, and elaborate carved ceiling panels and doors. This was the largest sacred building in the world. Although there is an eerie, crumbling beauty to this place now, you have to try to imagine it in its heyday. 
All this stonework would have been brightly painted, and in this corridor, there'd have been many hundreds of statues of the Buddha wrought out of precious gold. Uh, the light from the statues would have been reflected back from the walls, which would have been studded with emeralds and sapphires and rubies. And outside, there would have been crowds of monks, their eyes closed in meditation, their faces lit by the glow of torches, made out of jungle resin. Since Buddhism is primarily an educational system, meditation is a key component of that educational system. Meditation is the way you become viscerally and directly aware of all these deep connections and connectednesses to the universe. And you have to become directly aware of it to become free of being controlled by unconscious processes. And that freedom is liberation. That freedom is nirvana. I'd been invited by a group of trainee Buddhist monks to experience meditation for myself. Members of the Sangha can spend hours each day meditating. The way they sit, the position of their hands is copied from the practice of the Buddha himself. They are still and concentrate on their breathing, not doing anything to alter the way they breathe, not worrying about whether they're doing it right or wrong, clearing their minds of thoughts, of feelings of fear and anger, of the distractions of the outside world, just following the breathing and becoming one with each breath. I can't say I've managed to completely block out the sound of the world going on. And it feels hard to stay this still for so long. But if someone were to ask me if I had any anger in my head or my heart right now, I would have to say there is none. The Pali Canon advises that there are particularly good places to meditate. A mountain a hillside, a rock cave, a cemetery, an open field, open forest, the root of a tree deep in the jungle. And this place certainly fits some of those criteria. But I have to say, I think I'm probably gonna carry on meditating in my own sweet way for a while. Um, I'm not quite ready yet to do the deep breathing and the lotus position. But still, I have huge respect for the practice of meditation. Not least because it is a firm vote of confidence in the power of the human mind. It suggests that in order to transcend the difficulties of this world, we don't just need to appeal to a higher divine authority, but can look to our own consciousness. Well, certainly the people of Cambodia have had more cause than most to find internal resources to deal with the troubles that the world has thrown at them. Cambodia has suffered some of the worst violence and genocide of the last century. Between 1968 and 1976, over three million Cambodians were killed in the war that engulfed Vietnam and other countries of Southeast Asia. This was then followed by the terror and genocide unleashed by the Khmer Rouge, a communist movement that ruled Cambodia for four years. The Khmer Rouge dealt particularly viciously with Buddhism. Uh, thousands of monks were slaughtered and monasteries were destroyed. And if people tried to hold on to their beliefs, they were often tortured and killed. But gradually, as the nightmare is beginning to fade, Buddhism is finding its feet here again. And when you come to Angkor, you'll find little active shrines like this tucked away into corners. In Cambodia, Buddhism is slowly reasserting itself. This country, which had experienced such horrors, is now peaceful. And Angkor, which had been brutalized by the Khmer Rouge regime, is now a world tourist site once again. It's been very moving coming here to Cambodia because this place has been the home to the most dramatic twists and turns in the fortunes of Buddhism. For centuries, Buddhism was the philosophy of choice for both the kings and the people. 
And then thanks to the horrors of the Khmer Rouge, there was a chance that it was going to be eradicated virtually overnight. But gradually, gently, it is now making a comeback. And there's even a possibility that this place, which was once the biggest and most active Buddhist complex in the world, could be that again sometime in the future. While in Cambodia, Buddhism is emerging out of the darkness of the Khmer Rouge regime, Buddhism in mainland China and here in Hong Kong is also reasserting itself, an ancient tradition reappearing in modern society. Buddhism is on the rise once again, partly perhaps because its positive attitude feels well suited to an emerging superpower. Particularly popular is the Zen form of Buddhism, Little surprise given that Zen, although now typically associated with Japan, started off life in China. And I'm going to explore Zen in one of the places in the world where it is most vigorous. Hong Kong. Our sixth wonder is the giant Buddha that overlooks this great Asian city. This mammoth bronze statue was completed in 1993. It symbolizes the relationship between man and nature, people and religion. Well, the building of the giant Buddha in Hong Kong was a reassertion of an old Buddhist tradition of constructing massive uh, Buddhist images. And the monks who uh, initiated the project in Hong Kong had visited Japan and they'd visited various sites in mainland China and seen medieval massive images of Buddhas. And this was something they were trying to recreate in Lantau. It's the only statue of Buddha to face north towards Beijing and is named Jian Tan, after the Temple of Heaven in that city. When Buddhism first starts out, it seems that people actively choose not to represent the Buddha figuratively. But then, as the philosophy passes through regions like Afghanistan, which had a really strong Greek influence, thanks to the invasion of Alexander the Great, it becomes the done thing to represent the Buddha in human form. Now, once the belief system enters China, a new tradition gains popularity, not just to represent the Buddha in human form, but to do so on a monumental scale. And that's an art form that's now being revived here in Hong Kong. Everything about this statue means something. Uh, the Buddha is sitting in a lotus position, which shows that he was like the beauty of a lotus flower emerging from the muddy waters of a pond. His face is that beautiful round shape, which is supposed to be a reflection of the perfection of the moon. And his head is domed, which tells us just how wise he is. And his hands are interesting because the right hand is raised in a gesture of blessing. This is the Buddha's vow that he will release the entire world from its suffering. And on his chest, he's got that so-called swastika symbol. Now, of course, the swastika was unfortunately appropriated by the Nazis, even though they got it the wrong way round. But what it actually means is the power of the universe. So this tells us that the Buddha's compassion and wisdom is available to all. The Buddha statue sits on a lotus throne on top of an altar. It's surrounded by six smaller bronze statues. They're shown offering gifts like fruit and incense, gifts that symbolize different aspects of Buddhist philosophy, all virtues which are necessary to achieve enlightenment. The giant Buddha is part of the Po Lin Monastery and Temple Complex, set up nearly a hundred years ago by three Zen masters. Zen has developed as a part of Mahayana Buddhism, the school of Buddhism practiced in China and other northern Asian countries. Zen Buddhists believe that all people have the qualities that the Buddha had, 
and emphasised that these can be developed and were not unique to the Buddha only. The aim of Zen is to discover this quality within each person through meditation and practice of the Buddha's teachings. The ultimate goal is to become a completely enlightened Buddha. Meditation has always been central to Buddhism, but here in China, a new brand of meditation was born. It took its name from a Sanskrit word, dhyana, which is actually very hard to translate, but means a kind of alert, productive state of mind. In China, it was called Chan, and when it travels to Japan, it becomes Zen. It's a school of Buddhism which lays enormous emphasis on certain kinds of meditative practice. What you try to do is purely to empty your mind. It has a sort of ideology that rational thought is not going to get you to enlightenment or nirvana. It's practiced here in a small secluded monastery minutes away from the giant Buddha. Formal silent meditation is central to Zen and is practiced by both the laity and the ordained together. Some people find the concept of Zen quite difficult to grasp. So how would you define it? So Zen means we never separate our life and our practice. Zen is uh, like 24 hours when you are standing, sitting, walking, lying down. So never separate. You know, our everyday life and our practice cannot separate. There's not two things. Zen also means inside, inside, you know, our mind, and outside the object, inside, outside, boom, become one, that's Zen. So if you're not making that separation uh, between Zen practice and everyday life, does that mean that when you do everything, when you sweep the floor or prepare food that, or clean something, that that actually is an act of Zen itself? Zen means what are you doing now, you know? So somebody might get enlightenment while they're eating meal, washing bowl. All these we design to help people to be in the moment. And maybe at that moment, your mind become clear and your life become clear. This is called water bowl meditation, and the purpose is to carry the water without spilling a single drop. Now, the idea is that you can do this through the application of Zen, because if you think you're carrying a bowl of water, then you're bound to shake and lose some. But if you clear your mind completely, you will complete the task successfully. In the West, a lot of people have heard of Zen. It is something that's quite popular. Do you think that's partly because people's lives are so demanding and Zen offers a kind of a way out from that? I think not only the West are very busy, now Asia is more busy. <laughs> it's true. It's, true. <laughs> it's very like uh, money oriented. Everybody worry about the living. So it's very important our mind know how to relax and to be living at this moment and to keep clear. So if you can live in this present, even there's a, some problem up here, it's okay. You know, you have this clear mind and you are not agitated. I think these are very important practice for, for, for everybody. Mm -hmm. 
Zen practitioners today don't like to use specific words to limit what Zen is. But if you want to find a definition for the practice, probably as close as you'll get, is that this is something that really believes in the power of intuition and in a kind of productive simplicity. And I can see that cherishing intuition, living for the moment, living day by day with a clear mind, is a very productive way to spend your time. Perhaps it explains why, of all brands of Buddhism, Zen has become particularly attractive to those who live in our demanding 21st century. Zen, and its ancestor Chan, is a very practical form of Buddhist wisdom. It encourages a process of rediscovery by living simply. The Zen tradition emphasizes that enlightenment is possible here and now. Is it then very different from other forms of Buddhism? Zen means pointing directly to our mind. It means right now, wake up. You know, and be clear. What are you doing now? Actually, our mind is not complicated. Is our thinking make our life very complicated? So Zen is a tool to help us to bring back our mind to our everyday life and be simple. Zen, like all Buddhist practice, turns philosophy into a tool to help in day-to-day -day life. Meditation is used to bring about a tangible outcome either in the understanding of the world or in our ability to deal with it and with the suffering we see all around and feel within us. One thing that struck me is that whatever the regional variations of Buddhism, issues of suffering are right at the core of the philosophy. Now, that is really interesting because in general, over the last two and a half thousand years, cultures of the East have actually been very unabashed about suffering. They don't mind putting it center stage. Whereas in the West, these are issues that we can sometimes try to brush under the carpet. Um, in the modern age, for instance, we've been accused of trying to cheat death itself. But just look at that statue. There's the Buddha promising to deal with all the suffering in the world. So it does make you wonder what future Buddhism has as a global belief system. What's going to happen when ideas of the East, which put suffering to the fore, start to take root in the West? Buddhist ideas and philosophy have become increasingly popular in the fast-paced and highly competitive world of California. New Age concepts mixed with the counterculture of the hippies in the 1970s have made words like karma and nirvana commonplace. Buddhism offered a spiritual life and an emphasis on morality without being too authoritarian. Buddhism initially spread into the West, and especially the West Coast of the United States, in the 19th century, thanks to Japanese and Chinese laborers brought in to work on the railways. In Los Angeles, the first Buddhist temples were set up at the turn of the century. Today, the city is home to one of the largest Buddhist temples in the West, She Lai Temple at Hacienda Heights, our seventh wonder of the Buddhist world. Here I'm going to try to understand what has to be the most important Buddhist concept, the ultimate goal for Buddhists, Nirvana. The planning and construction of the temple in the 1980s was met with suspicion and resistance from local communities. The building of the temple at its current location survived six public hearings and 165 explanatory sessions. Finally, in 1985, the temple was granted a building permit and it was completed in 1988. I'll tell you what, there is definitely a wealth of here and that is Buddhas. Yeah. I've never seen so many. <laughs> there must be, what, 10,000 or yes, something at least on 10, these walls? There are 10,000 Buddhas right here, big and small. And if you look at all the Buddhas, uh, you may find some names there. It's, it's a Chinese practice that the people make an offering 
and then to have the name of the family there is their Buddha. Oh, okay. And it's also a, a form of supporting the temple. And they, they come in and they say, I have a Buddha in there. It's, it's like the connection between the Buddha outside and the Buddha inside. One of the American Buddhists who come to the temple is Mario C. He became a Buddhist six years ago. There are some who'd say that the attraction of Buddhism for many Americans is that it's pleasingly mystical, it comes from the East, but at the same time it ties in with a kind of anything goes materialist lifestyle. How do you speak I to I don't that? mean any disrespect by this, <laughs> but I have some friends who use Buddhism and Eastern religion, Eastern philosophy, and they sort of mix it up with New Age. And that's okay. If it works for them, that's fine. But my concern is that it is that sort of anything goes. You know, it's a free market in spirituality, so whatever I'm saying or thinking today is fine. Because we have these core teachings in Buddhism, it keeps us in check. So we don't sort of go into anything that, if it feels good, it's okay. We're really trying to avoid that. This Buddhism gave me a discipline without the necessity of a god to reward me or punish me. There has been a tenfold increase in the number of Buddhists in Europe and America over the last 40 years. Most observers put the figure at between two to three million practicing Buddhists in America, with the number of Buddhist sympathizers estimated at over 10 million. The Shay Lai Temple is one example of the modern expansionism of Buddhism. Many Buddhists come to the Shay Lai Temple for worship. Others come to practice meditation. In the West, there's recently been great interest in yoga simply as a way to keep fit and as a form of meditation. Yoga has its roots in Indian traditions that predate both Hinduism and Buddhism, and it's sometimes used by Hindus to assert mind over matter. For Buddhists, yoga's key purpose is to achieve personal enlightenment. It is a very ancient philosophy, Buddhism. But in some ways, do you think it's very suited to American life? Because it does have this, this kind of can-do attitude. It's, it's very suited to America. Uh, one reason is that we've been materialistic. We're, we're known for it. And I found, in my experience, it doesn't get you to where you want to be. And I can't believe that I'm alone in that. I can't believe that. It offers uh, reasons why that is. I'm sure other people like me who can't understand why all this stuff didn't make them happy would be looking for something else. So I'm not surprised that it is um, popular. Um, it's not against any other religion and it's not against science. It's very in line with everything. The temple then offers American Buddhists lots of reasons to visit. But if you're a devotee of Buddhism, then one of your main motivations for coming here is to seek enlightenment, nirvana. Uh, now, I'd love to be able to tell you that I've got a textbook definition for what nirvana actually is. But considering the Buddha himself said that it was beyond words, beyond logic, uh, I suspect this is going to be quite a tricky concept to pin down. Nirvana certainly is a state of mind, and it's a state of mind in which you have abolished strong emotions of very much wanting things, or very much hating things, or being confused. It's a state of mind which you attain, and at that moment and thereafter, you enjoy a kind of blissful calm. And that path? Is the end of that path nirvana? Is that your goal? Yes, nirvana, enlightenment, full understanding, awakening, those are all terms that are very similar. And to me, it's understanding the truth, understanding what this is, what it really is. How confident are you that nirvana is a goal you're going to attain? I am cautiously optimistic. How about that? <laughs> Uh, there are people that say that it's very possible. 
And these are people that are very smart people, and uh, I'm following uh, their advice, and uh, I think it can be done. I think it can be done. Like so much in Buddhism, Nirvana clearly has to be experienced, not explained. But for Buddhists, the journey to get there, the path you take, seems to be as important as the arriving. Buddhists will tell you that Nirvana has no fixed point in time or space. And that's actually a little ironic, because one of the few accepted fixtures of the Buddhist story is where the Buddha himself found enlightenment. We're told that that took place in northern India under the spreading branches of a people tree. Which is where my quest had started, at Bogaya, at this spot where it said Buddhist philosophy really began 2,500 years ago. In this journey, I've explored key facets of Buddhist belief and got a little closer to understanding something vital about the core of Buddhist philosophy, the Dharma. The Dharma is simply the way the world is, and we can all best live our lives if we follow a path that allows us to deal with the world as passionately, as compassionately, as positively, and as wisely as possible. Now, whatever the permutations and interpretations of Buddhism, that seems to me to be pretty simple and pretty enlightened. I've learned about karma, how mindful actions impact on our lives, about samsara, the cycle of life, birth and death, about meditation, about Zen, and the final goal for all Buddhists, Nirvana. I've seen some of the most beautiful architecture inspired by Buddhist ideas, and how after 25 centuries, Buddhism still attracts millions across the globe. A philosophy that is rooted in its ancient past and yet gives character to the modern world. How Buddhism places the responsibility to realize the truth on all of us. As Buddhism traveled, it transformed the cultures it came into contact with, just as it too was transformed. You wonder if the Buddha could ever possibly have imagined the impacts that his ideas would have on human history, particularly given the one thing he was certain about was that impermanence and change were the only things that were definite in this world. And just listen to this, it's one of his most poetic epithets. So shall you think of all this fleeting world, a star at dawn, a bubble in a stream, a flash of lightning in a summer cloud, a flickering lamp, a phantom, and a dream. Well, the Buddha's dreams of 2,500 years ago are still with us, and they've been made incarnate in one of the most tenacious belief systems of all time, and in some of the most iconic and beautiful monuments in the world. Tomorrow night on BBC Two, a tumultuous true story retold. Kira Knightley and Ray Fine star in The Duchess at nine.